In this tutorial, we're going to take the fleur-de-lis model we created in a previous example and create the basic tool pass to be able to cut this out on a CNC machine. Let's start with a new session of Aspire, and we're going to open up an existing file. Now, this is a file that we created back in the fleur-de-lis modeling tutorial. If you haven't seen that yet, then I highly recommend that you do if you're interested in that sort of thing. For now, we're just going to select that, and that'll be installed in your V11 tutorials file under fleur-de-lis, and it's called fleur-de-lis underscore modeling dot crv 3D. We'll just click open. Now, right in our 2D view, you're going to see what we ended up our last tutorial with, which is the grayscale bitmaps of our 3D components. We can tile our view so we can actually see the composite model for that. And that looks pretty nice. So we can look straight down on that again. Now, the first thing we're going to do before we start to think about the tool pathing of this project is we need to take a look and see what size material we might need. Also check the thickness of our composite model to make sure that it fits inside of our material thickness. There's a couple of different ways we can check the actual job dimensions that we set up originally. We can look down here in our bottom left-hand corner of the screen. You'll see that we have a width of seven inches, a height of nine inches, and a depth at three quarters of an inch. That's our material. Or we can take a look in our job setup here. We can click that and you'll see that we have the job size listed right here, and that's that's more or less the material dimensions that we're going to need for this job. So it's seven by nine, and our material is three quarters of an inch thick. So let's just cancel that. And let's have a look at the actual shape height or the full thickness of our composite model. And to do that, we can go to our modeling tab and have a look at the scale Z height of model option. So we can just click on there. And you'll see we have some options here. We have our current height is just under a half an inch. The minimum Z is at zero, so that means it's sitting right on our zero plane. And our maximum Z is the actual thickness of our composite model. Now, if we had a negative minimum Z height, then that would mean that our composite model is actually below our modeling plane or our zero plane, which we might want to fix. In this case, what we want to do is we want to scale this composite model to be a, exactly a half inch thick. So down here, we can have the choice of actually using the slider if we'd like to slide it up and down, but that's going to be hard to get that thickness just perfectly. So we can use the set exact height option. Let's click on that. In the middle of our screen, a new dialog will pop up. And all we need to do is just type in 0.5 an inch and click apply. And that will adjust all of our components. So the total thickness of our composite model is now at a half inch. And we can close this down and then click OK. One more thing that we're going to need is a way to tell the software that we only want it to cut just the composite model that we see. We don't want it to actually cut out into this white space here of our job because the chances are pretty good we're going to have hold downs there. Maybe our clamps or maybe we're going to use screws to hold down. The material to our wasteboard and we don't want our tooling to go near those. So the easiest way to do that is to create a vector that is the profile of our composite model. And in this case, we have one already made for us. This oval right here was the first oval that we used when we constructed the composite model for this. And we used it to create our base. And it's going to come in really handy here for us to isolate our tooling to. So we're only going to cut inside of that vector or slightly outside based on our tool paths that we set up. There are a few different ways you can get access to your tool paths tab. One of the ways is to use the icon that's right here, just below the word tool paths in our menu bar. If you click that, you'll see that on the right hand side, our tool paths tab opens right up for you and it's automatically pinned in place. So it won't retract back into the side of your screen. If we go ahead and click the same icon that we just did a second ago, but with the arrow pointing in the reverse, reverse direction, we'll switch back over to our design tab and you can jump back and forth if you'd like to using that. Another way we can do it is we can just hover over top of our tool paths tab and our tool paths tab will be exposed, but it's not going to be pinned down for us. So if we want to pin it down, we're going to need to click the little pin. This is really great because you get access to your 
design tab and your toolpath tab all at the same time in case you need all those tools. One of the little things that does happen is your toolpath tab will actually cover up the buttons to maximize or minimize your 3D view. So to get those re-exposed again, you just need to re-click arrange your views. And there we have it. And we can see everything that we need now to get on to developing our toolpaths. The first thing we should always check before we start creating our tool pass is our material setup. And we can just click this set button right here. And this gives us access to all of the material settings that we have. Uh, just in case maybe we had a change of heart or we can't find a piece of material that's going to fit properly. Or maybe we want to choose a different place to start our actual tool path from. So right off the bat, we can go ahead and change the thickness of our material. We're going to leave it at 0.75 of an inch. Now, when we first did the modeling tutorial for this fleur-de-lis, we had set our datum to the middle to make it a little bit easier to model. Well, now that we're actually going to create our tool paths, uh, we're going to move it to our bottom left. So we can click that here and you'll see that now our datum is updated to the bottom left of our 3D preview. We are going to zero off our material surface. And then we get a chance to choose where we'd like to position our composite model within our virtual material block. Currently right now, it's sitting right at the very top of our material block. That's the light brown area here. And then we have some leftover material at the bottom and that's displayed here by this darker brown. And you can see that we have a gap below our model of a quarter inch. So our composite model is a half an inch, which we've already set earlier. And the balance of that of the three quarters of an inch is 0.25 of an inch and that's displayed right here. Now if we want to, we can actually sync our composite model in a little bit into our material. This comes in useful if our material isn't perfectly flat on the top. That way we'll avoid having any missing detail in our composite model because there's a dip in our material. So to do that we can use our slider if we would like to or we can simply choose gap above model and type in a number here. So in this case, we're going to put in 0 0.05 and that will leave us a slight gap at the top. So we're going to avoid any kind of strange surface features of our material. Now, just below that, we're going to see some text here. So it tells us what our composite model's thickness is. And like I said, and like you had saw, we changed that earlier to be exactly at half inch. And if I hadn't done that, we can go ahead and choose to set that here. And then it tells us where our modeling plane is within our material block. And it's at minus 0 0.55 an inch. And that's our model thickness plus the gap above our model. And that's, so that's, that's where that number comes from. This is an important area to look at and consider when you're thinking about your job on your CNC machine. The clearance number here is the space above your material that your tool will be rapid will rapidly move to in a z direction before it does any rapid movements on an x or a y basis and this is important because if you have a hold down or a clamp or maybe a screw head that's proud of your material you're going to want to make sure that this number is enough to avoid that when you're doing those rapid moves the plunge here is set up so that you can rapidly plunge down a certain distance before you change over to the safe plunge speed for your tool. If you have a thick piece of material, this number here could actually save you quite a bit of time, but just be careful that you set it up properly. Now, in this case, these two numbers are exactly the same. So when it goes to plunge, it's actually going to look at the tool setting and plunge down at the speed that you've defined in that. Now your home and start positions, the way I have it set up here is that my home is going to be at zero, zero. And when I set my Z height at the top of my material, it's going to retract up a quarter of an inch before we actually go ahead and start cutting. That's important um, because again, you might have a hold down in the way or you might not want to start right on your material surface before you go. Now, both of these two boxes here are important and you need to make sure that they're set up so they're safe and appropriate for your CNC machine. Everyone's will be slightly different. And then we can just click OK. We're going to create three 
pretty standard tool paths to cut out this composite model from our material. We're going to start off with a 3D roughing tool path, which is going to be us taking a really big cutter and removing the majority of the material in a fast and efficient way. And then we're going to go in with a smaller cutter and use a 3D finishing tool path to establish the detail that we'd like to see in our finished piece. And then so we can remove the actual finished project out of our material block, we are going to create a profile cut to cut out the job. So to start off with, we're going to go ahead and look at our 3D roughing tool path, which is right here. And we're going to start off working from the top down. Now with any of these tool paths, if you get lost and you'd like to have more information, you can just click the little question mark right here and that'll bring you right to the appropriate spot in our help guide. The first thing we need is a tool defined to cut out our material. And so we can go ahead and select a tool from our tool database. And in this case, we're going to use an end mill. And in our tool database, we'll see all the parameters that we've set for that tool. Now we can change any of these parameters right now if we would like to, but these will be kept in our tool database forever. So make sure that you change them um, or the changes that you make are the ones that you're going to want to have for the future until you change them again, of course. For right now, we're going to leave them the way they are and we can select this tool. Now, if we want to temporarily change some of the parameters for this tool, then we can go ahead and choose to edit our tool settings. Now this will give us a subset of our tool settings, but we can change these again temporarily for this tool path if we need to make any little adjustments for the material that we're cutting into. But for right now, we're just going to say okay to that. The next section, we're going to choose the boundary limit for our tooling. Like we had mentioned before, we're going to use the oval that we have currently selected in our 2D view to limit our tooling. But we do have some other options if we'd like to. We can use a model boundary, we can use our material boundary, we can use a selected vector, or we can select a level. And like I had said, we're going to use the selected vector. Now we can go ahead and cut outside that vector, a defined distance if we would like to. And typically the standard process is to cut outside of that the diameter of your tool. In this case, it's going to be 0.25 of an inch. So it'll cut outside of this line, the diameter of our tool and clear out some material there for us. We're also going to leave behind a machining allowance. And this is like a skin of material that we're going to go in later on with our 3D finishing toolpath and remove. So right now it's set to 0 0.04 and that's pretty standard and that's great. So now we can go ahead and choose our roughing strategy and we have two different options. We have Z-level roughing or 3D raster. We'll start off with Z-level roughing. This is going to create a series of pockets based on the tool parameters that we have set up and remove a lot of material. Now this is going to do it quickly and fastly and very efficiently, but we will have some extra material left behind that a 3D raster will remove. And what a 3D raster will do is it'll actually go along the contours of the surface of your composite model and remove the material based on that. It does take a little bit longer to do, but in some cases, if you're going to use a really fine 3D finishing tool, this is the way to go. You can also have an option here, or we also have an option here to avoid areas that are already machined, and that does make this speed up a little bit. But the most efficient one for us right now is going to be the Z level. And we have a few options here for that. We can choose to profile around the vector that we've defined. Either we can do that first, and that might be useful if we were going to cut into a brittle material and we're worried about chipping as the raster goes back and forth. It might be handy for that. Or we can choose last. So once it gets done doing all of its raster uh, pockets, then it will go around and clean up the edges for us, those outside edges along the inside of our vector that we've chosen. Or we can go ahead and choose none. And for us, we're going to make sure that's set to last. Now we have an option for the order. We have level by level or depth first. So level by level means that it's going to generate a complete pass at a given depth, and that will be your pass depth that you've defined in your tool over the entire model before advancing to the next level or the next pocket. This is kind of the default option. The other option here is going to be depth first, which if a model consists of separate regions, 
The software will generate a toolpath for all the passes at increasing depths over each region individually first. So for instance, if you had two deep pockets, it would do one full deep pocket first and then move on to the second deep pocket. It'll be up to you to choose which is the best for your job, but for us right now, we're gonna choose level by level. We're gonna choose a raster angle of zero. We're not gonna use ramp or plunge moves, but you might want to use those if you'd like to. And we're gonna rename this 3D roughing and delete the one out of there. And we are going to click calculate. And then we're gonna preview that visible toolpath. And you can see those pockets that I was talking about, it goes down in even increments based on our tool setup. Um, and you can take a look at that setup if you'd like to by closing this down, going back into your tool path and looking quickly at your tool. And you'll see that the pass depth is set to 0 0.1. So each one of those pockets is 0 0.01 deep. So we can close that down and we can retake a look at our preview for that. And let's close this. Our next tool path we need to develop is going to be our 3D finishing toolpath. So we're going to go ahead and choose that right here. And the first thing we're going to be able to do is to add in a series of tools. Um, if we add in more than one tool, then we'll be taking advantage of our rest machining option, which we're not going to do in this case, but it's good to know that is available for you in the end. If I do want to add in another tool to take advantage of that feature, then I just need to select another tool and it will add those in here. I can choose to remove a tool if I happen to put one in by mistake, or I can edit this tool like I explained in our last 3D roughing toolpath temporarily for this particular toolpath. But in this case, I'm going to keep the 1 8 inch ball nose end mill here. I'm not going to edit my options at all, and I'm going to move right on to my machining limit boundary. So again, like our 3D roughing toolpath, I'm going to use the selected vector that we have selected here in our 2D view. And I'm going to give it a bit of a boundary offset. And again, like I did with the roughing pass, I'm going to use the diameter of my tool, which is going to be 0.125 of an inch. And what that does is it's going to, again, shoot outside of this vector or cut outside this vector, the diameter of my tool. And in this particular case, it will help to alleviate any of the filleting that we might get because we're using a rounded radius tool. And you'll see the difference if you don't put that in there, that it'll actually just cut to the edge. And then when you go to do your cutout pass, you might end up having some material left behind that wasn't taken away by your finishing tool path. So definitely I would recommend you having some sort of a boundary offset in this situation. Because we only have one tool defined up here, then we don't get access to any of our rest machining options. And now we can go ahead and look at our tool specific strategies. Now, if we had more than one tool up there, we can choose a different strategy for each tool. And that might be beneficial depending on the part that you're cutting. In this case, we have again, an offset toolpath strategy or a raster toolpath strategy. To look at the raster first, because it has less options, is we can just define a raster angle and it will cut back and forth, up and down, or at that angle and remove that 0 0.04 of an inch of material to show us our detail that we want. And we can define that angle, of course, right here if we'd like to. But for us, the better strategy, because we're using a oval, would be an offset strategy. And what that'll do is it will work from the inside of our vector boundary out to the edge of our vector boundary in circles. And as it moves out, it will remove that 0 0.04 inch of material, again, showing off the detail that we want. We have a choice of choosing the direction that we'd like that to go in, either climb or conventional. We're going to leave that at climb. Now, one of the interesting things about this particular tool path is as it moves out, it'll do one circle and then it will move out. Well, that move that step over move will end up sometimes leaving a little bit of a mark behind, a little dwell mark. And you may see that in your finished piece by these radial lines that kind of go from the inside to the outside. Now you can help to minimize those by using a step over retract. And so what the software will actually do is it will calculate a retract move. So it'll go around in a circle and then we'll retract the tool on the Z axis up a little bit or whatever you define here, move over and then plunge back down again and then do the next circle. And that will help to alleviate those dwell marks 
For right now, we're just going to leave that at zero. We're not going to worry about that. And we can rename our toolpath 3D finishing. We'll just delete out the one and then we can calculate that. and we can preview our visible toolpaths. And that's what I expected to see, and that looks quite nice. And we can look back down on our job and we can close out of this. Now for our last toolpath, we're gonna create a profile toolpath, which we're gonna treat as a cutout toolpath. We can click that. Our start depth is gonna be at zero, and we wanna cut down the full depth of our material. In this case, I have one inch in here, which is a quarter inch thicker than our material. If I remember the thickness of my material, I can just put in the 0.75. Or what I can do is I can type in the letter Z and press equals on my keyboard, and the software will go and take a look at the thickness of my material and then place that value in there. And that's perfect. In this case, I don't need to see my advanced toolpath options, but if you do, you can go ahead and just open that up and you can take a look at those advanced options. Now, if you're interested in more information about the 2D profile toolpath, we have a whole guide set aside for that that you might want to look at in the end. So for now, we're going to hide those again. We're going to use a quarter inch end mill to create our profile cutout with. And again, we can select a new tool if we'd like to, or we can edit these parameters temporarily for this toolpath. We have the option of telling it what side of the line or whether we want to cut on the line when we're creating this toolpath. For us, outside is best. If we cut inside or on the line, then we'd end up re removing part of our 3D component that we don't want to do. So we're gonna go ahead and cut outside that line. We can choose again the direction of cut if we'd like to. We're gonna leave that at climb. We can add in some ramp moves if we'd like to, but again, we're not gonna do that. And we do want to add in some tabs. So we can go ahead and click that. We get an opportunity to set up the thickness of our tabs and the length of our tabs if we would like to. In my case, I'm gonna leave it the way it is right there, but you again are gonna to need to check that to make sure that they're set up so they're safe and appropriate for your hold down method that you're using. If you have a vacuum table, then you may not need tabs at all. And we can edit those tabs. So right at the very top of this, we can tell the software how many tabs we'd like it to have. So we're gonna say four. And if we choose to add our tabs, you'll see that in our 2D view, you'll see that the tabs are being indicated on our vector by these little yellow T's. And we can click on those or left mouse button and we can drag them around and put them where we'd like them to be if we would like to. Or we can double click and add one in if we want to as well. But for right now, I like the position of these. They're in a good safe places. And we can just go ahead and choose close. Now we can name our toolpath and we're gonna call this cutout and we can calculate that and preview our visible toolpath. And you'll see that we get our tabs left behind there and they look really good where they are. Let's close that down and look straight down on our job again. And that's pretty much it for this. Just with those three basic toolpaths, we can cut this out on our machine. Now, again, you're gonna to wanna to think this through and make sure that your settings for your material are safe and appropriate for your machine. Now, if you'd like to save off your toolpaths, I would suggest that you go ahead and have a look at our toolpath saving guide that will give you all the ins and outs on how to save off the toolpaths for this job. And for now, let's just go ahead and save this off. So we're gonna to go to file, save as, and we'll go to our directory here and we'll just call this fleur de lis underscore tooling. And then we can click save. I hope the tutorial gave you enough information to get you started with the basic toolpaths you need to cut a 3D part.